All right, let's go ahead and touch on some more new releases from uh, over the course of the year so far. And we're mostly going to touch on animated, which is just my favorite genre anymore. Um, if, if you're new here, it, it, I don't have anything inherently against animation. I've just, over the past several years, I've just had kind of an emotional disconnect with it that I can't really explain. And it's, it's just become really difficult for me to, like, you know, fall in love with animated movies the way I used to. Um, but I'm just, I'm just kind of putting that more on me than, like, you know, the state of animation or anything like that, because... Obviously, as we'll see with at least a couple of things here, um, in, in some places, animation's going down a really great path and a really new sort of innovative path. Uh, like we'll see with like the Turtles and the Spider-Verse and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, this that's just coming from my perspective. But uh, as far as uh, Across the Spider-Verse, speaking of that, I did push that towards the end of this video because I'm not really going to for a reason I'll explain when we get there, I'm not really going to touch on it that much. Um, so that, so if, if you were here for that, um, it's probably going to be very underwhelming and pointless to you. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just throw that out now. But uh, let's uh, go back and start with uh, the Super Mario Brothers movie, which is one of those movies that's yet again starting up that whole, or at least at the time it was, I don't know if it's blown over by now, the whole critics versus fans thing that movies seem to conjure up every few months now where it's um obviously critics are coming from a place of all well, if it's not you know this you know great narrative movie or whatever um then it's not that great or if it's just the fans saying oh it just does what it needs to do it doesn't matter if you know the story's the bare minimum or whatever and that clashing that just goes on and it's <laughs> and more often than not um for me, it usually ends up being those movies aren't really for me either. Like, I end up kind of siding with the critics. As far as this one goes, um, I don't have an extremely strong connection with Mario in general. I, go, I mean, it goes back a very long way, back to uh, when, like, me and my brother would play our cousins Super, Super Nintendo whenever we'd uh, be with them. And then as, like, you know, the Mario Party games happened and the N64 happened... But the thing about it is, while those games, like the original games and then, um, like Mario Party and stuff like that, the one, the ones with the N64, like, you know, tennis and golf and all that, that's kind of, while it was, I was all about it back then, um, it kind of stopped there. Like, like, the third Mario Party was basically, like, the end of my Mario run in my life. Um, just because I'm, I'm just not a gamer in general, so I was never really branching off that much unless somebody was kind of, I was going down that path with somebody. So, um, like, I feel like the seminal Mario game for, like, this sort of new generation would, I guess, be Mario Kart, which, uh, I don't know, unless I did, like, once or twice and forgot, I don't think I've ever played any variation of Mario Kart or anything like that. Like, my, my Mario life kind of stopped at Mario Party, so... That's where I'm coming from as far as having a passion for the property itself, um, where it's not, it's there, but it's not much. Um, so keeping that in mind, and keeping fa the fact that I usually side with the critics on this critics versus fans kind of thing, um, I, I don't think this is anything great, but what I do like about this movie is that there is just sort of a general likability about it. Like, there's, yeah, um, the story's, like, really, really thin, and it's not really doing anything particularly innovative. It's just kind of, it's basically just trying to bring the game to life, and that's about it. Um, and while I can see where that is maybe falling short for people that kind of want more out of it, or we're hoping they would kind of branch off the ideas and kind of cr maybe create new things or use it to, like, this, use it to a story's advantage, um... Even though that's kind of missing here, and it does feel pretty paper-thin, I do think the likability just itself of the movie uh, takes it a really long way. And it can it can survive on that uh, for a pretty long time, because when we see uh, when we see Mario and Luigi, who are... It, it, it does seem pretty... I don't know if I want to say corporate. Um, for all the voices to be so recognizable, like um, Chris Pratt and Charlie Day being Mario and Luigi, just sounds like something... Uh, a boardroom was like, oh, these are two people that are kind of popular right now, right? Um, especially in Chris Pratt's case. And the thing about it was, I know when that first teaser trailer came out, people were really critical of how 
not charismatic Chris Pratt sounded. And the idea of that, it just immediately I was like, I, I'm just... It just feels like such a corporate product. Like, I just really don't care. That's It took me so long to see this movie, not because I thought it would be bad or anything like that, and I was, like, really fixated on that. I just really didn't care about it for a very long time um, to where I would just kind of forget that it existed. And then, I mean, despite the fact it being one of, like, the highest grossing movies of the year, but, um, but I was surprised what, that I kind of kept forgetting that... Chris Pratt was Mario, where it's like, I mean, it's not like he's, <laughs> I, I think I credit it to the immersion the movie sets in in itself, and how good the animation is, because I've also been really critical lately of just the way animation has gone in general, especially with um, computer animation getting things more and more sort of artificial looking, but the way it's like, and I, I don't know how to describe that, but it's like, because obviously animation is going to look artificial regardless, but I mean... Looking at the animation in this particular movie, it looks like there's, like, actual weight to everybody and everything. It looks like... the Everything in this movie looks like it can be touched, despite the fact that it's animated. And I feel like that's something... It feels like there's been a soullessness with a lot of animation for the last decade or probably at least 15 years, probably. How animation just feels like it's been, been getting more and more soulless the more, like, you know... CGI dependent than it gets. So to see something like this where it actually feels like the animation has a life to it, um, feels like, obviously not to the extent of like, you know, Turtles or Spider-Verse, which we're going to get into, but in its own way, I like the fact that it kind of had that sort of weighty look to it, uh, to where it looked like an actual world with actual people, despite them looking pretty much like they do in a video game. Uh, I thought was really impressive overall. And like I said, that that in general just adds a lot to the experience of it, to where I could do things like kind of forget that Chris Pratt was playing Mario a little bit. Um, but like uh, people like, you know, Charlie Day are a little too recognizable. And I, th I think Seth Rogen is kind of the most guilty of being so recognizable that... R Seth Rogen's voice is so recognizable as Seth Rogen's voice, and Donkey Kong is so recognizable as Donkey Kong. Putting those two things together was really weird. Like, it, you're constantly conscious of the fact that Seth Rogen's voice is coming out of Donkey Kong. <laughs> um, so that, and I, and I feel like that also maybe made it suffer more than I would have expected, because it was about the time that Donkey Kong becomes a crucial character that I felt like I was kind of starting to check out a little bit. The whole, like, everything set in Donkey Kong Country, I was kind of... Like, I, I felt like it was kind of finally starting to wear thin a little bit, and the energy was kind of starting to wind down for me. Um, but on its way there, like I, said, I, was, I felt surprisingly immersed in the environment, um, and just sort of being able to go with the flow of it and not really care too much about, you know, the idea that it could be a little more than what it is here. Um, I, also, I also like the fact of um, little... Like, it's not without sort of being self-referential, but not necessarily in a completely over-the-top way that's constantly drawing attention to itself, which is the easy way to do the self-referential stuff that most that's a trap that a lot of these sort of fall into. But, like, the idea of how much focus they put on the fact that they are plumbers and the fact that they... Like, wh like when they come home for the day and they take off, like, their hats and gloves, um, and, like, so it... Like, it it kind of sets in, it's like, oh yeah, these are work clothes. I forgot their hats and their gloves can come off. Like, it's kind of jarring at first to see them without them. And then you have that person that calls out, uh, if they're plumbers, shouldn't the last thing they're wearing be white gloves? And it's like, yeah, I actually never thought about that. That's the kind of self-referential stuff I feel like actually works, where the crowd can actually say, I never even thought about that, even though I've been looking at these characters my entire life. <laughs> Um, so they do that kind of stuff well when it's not, you know, super over-the-top and, like, blatantly obvious about itself. Um, and the moments where it does feel like the game, where it could seem like, you know, cheap nostalgia points or whatever, but to actually bring that to life in the way the movie's animated actually doesn't... It's It sounds easier to do than I imagine it was when you're actually watching it play out. Because we do have stuff that's nice, like, um, how it kind of, like, you know, scrolls from left to right during some scenes when Mario and Luigi are in action or whatever. Um, there's the whole scene where he runs around town with, uh, Toad, 
and there's a lot of stuff where it just feels it feels like you're going through a level of the game but from like different angles uh can be really sort of fun and feel kind of new and fresh despite the fact that it's doing something because it's familiar to us um but like i said j just seeing something from a different angle can be really <laughs> can be really interesting and exciting um but it's and it's also got you know like funny throwaway lines here and there um where i was talking about the clothes references but there's also i think it's mario tells luigi you can't be scared all the time and luigi says you'd be surprised just little lines like that um hit really well and show the dynamic between them and if anything i feel like that's where the problem with the movie comes in where People like critics have been saying a lot, like, you know, it needs to have, a, maybe it needs a bit more of a narrative or it needs stronger characterization or whatever. Um, and honestly, I think the one thing that probably could have easily fixed that criticism is the brotherly dynamic between them and kind of focusing on that because there's one scene in this movie that's really genuinely touching where I think it's it's after Luigi's been taken prisoner and he's remembering back to a time that when they were like babies um, and we see Mario being protective of him like on the playground and there's like no dialogue it's just a scene that plays out and we can see in the context what's going on here and it's like this core memory for Luigi and how much their how strong their brotherly bond is and how much it means to both of them which is I guess supposed to be the driving force of the movie since it's Mario having to rescue Luigi but I think that's the problem, is that the idea of Luigi being taken prisoner and being the one that has to be saved. Now, I get having Mario team with Peach to save Luigi is a clever way to do that. Like, this is normally something I'd be praising because it's a clever way to take the thing that we know, but tweaking it a little bit, um, which adds to this sort of expected but also unexpected kind of thing, where it's like you get what you want, but you're also getting something new at the same time. And that's great and everything, but the movie is called the Super Mario Brothers, <laughs> and it does feel like they're trying to make the emotional core of the movie the brotherly bond between them. And I feel like we probably could have done significantly more with that if they were together for the movie, <laughs> instead of having Luigi be a prisoner and essentially basically not in the movie for a very long period of time. So... Like I said, I can see why they did that, but I feel like that's where they sacrificed the um, what the emotional core could have been between the two of them. So that's unfortunate. I feel like that's where the weak point is in the movie, I think. And so, like I said, then we have to get to points where we have to rely on the action of it and the idea of it feeling like, you know, one of the games or whatever. And once you realize how much they're relying on that, by the time we get to about the hour mark is when it starts to when, like, the energy of it kind of started feel like, to feel like it was wearing off. And like I said, when we got the Donkey Kong Country is when I was basically checking out. Um, I think that's that's what it needed, was just an emotional core. It could be, you know, the basic generic story that it is, but if you've got a, an emotional core, that's when it really doesn't seem to matter as far as what the actual plot is. Um, because there's something that... Because that will be what pulls you in enough. And obviously... It seemed to work for work enough for the fans that even if you don't have a strong emotional core or much of a story, um, just the action itself can work, and we've seen that work also. But like I said, I think it's because we got that hint of it with that flashback scene where it's like, oh, that's that's what we're missing. There was wait, you realize how little of it there is when we only get one small scene of it. And it's like, okay, more of that would have definitely added another sort of layer here that this movie probably really needed. So that's where I feel like I got held back. But like I said, everything else um, is fun. I love uh, Jack Black's Bowser. I d and the idea that he's obsessed with Peach was an interesting... <laughs> was an, and the way they, you know, go about that and make jokes about it um, is... It, they do it in a really funny way. I will say that... Uh, Having seen this movie super late after all the hype has happened, um, I kind of thought the Peaches song was gonna be more than it was, because <laughs> that was like this whole thing. They made like a whole, they made like two music videos out of it. People are like, oh, it should be nominated for original song or something like that. And it's um, like, I mean, Jack Black can make anything work musically. <laughs> He's proved this over and over and over again. Um, but I was not expecting like three fourths of the song to just be him saying Peaches' name. So I don't know if that I I don't know if it was part of the joke how hyped that was, 
Um, but it's, I, I, I don't know. Um, that was another thing that was kind of putting me off before I actually saw the movie, where it felt very laid out in a very corporate way, where it's like, like how Barbie had Ken's song, and how they were making that, this whole viral sensation and all that, and how it's like, you, you can see how manufactured the viral sensations are, was kind of putting me off, and so, now that I've seen, like, what the Peaches song is in context, it's like, that, the hype around that feels very, very manufactured, <laughs> even though, like I said, Jack Black can make anything work musically, um, still, that was quite underwhelming, um, but, yeah, that's basically what I take away from this. Um, it's very simple. I, I was surprised by how, despite how I said my, you know, the I felt like the energy was kind of starting to die down as it went. It's still pretty well paced until we get to that last 20 minutes. Like, right when we're getting around to the climax. Other than that, um, it, it does feel pretty well paced without getting to sort of ahead of itself, where some of these movies that are trying to go for younger audiences will put all of their energy in all at once, and then, like, they after they run out of gas, like, 20 minutes in, and then just the pacing stops entirely. Um, thankfully, like I said, it made it most of the runtime before it started to slow down for me, so um, that I can appreciate. So, yeah, I, it, it's fine. I don't really think it's anything to get hyped up about in a positive or a negative way. It's just fine. To me, but like I said, for people that have more passion for Mario in general, and it's more, you know, part of their being and their memories and all that, um, I, I, yeah, I can probably understand it hitting harder, so, um, but I can also imagine people getting really, you know, people who have Mario, like, really within them could be, you know, underwhelmed and disappointed by this, which I've, I've heard of that happening, but significantly less than the people that are happy with it, so, um, but I'm just gonna fall in the middle here and say that, um, I, I, it's it's fine. I can say that I like it, um, and th how that goes a long way, but that's pretty much the extent of it. So, to go on to uh, the new Ninja Turtles movie, Mutant Mayhem, which I did not know until literally the end credits um, that this was a Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg thing. I had no idea. that I did not see that anywhere <laughs> at all. Um, I didn't, I didn't really have much thought going into this movie, period, because me and my brother did a whole video on this channel of the three live-action movies from the 90s, and of course I, I still to this day adore the first movie, as I, I, I'm pretty sure most, uh, Turtles fans do, and the, the second and third are, they are what they are, but you know, for that, you know, nostalgia's sake, we do end up going back to it, but, um, that first one is still high quality in many regards, uh, surprisingly enough, and the only other movie that I'm aware of is the 2007 animated one with Chris Evans, which I saw when it came out, and I have no memory of it whatsoever, it did not stick at all, I really wasn't into it, and I guess they've been doing other and it, like Nickelodeon's been doing more animated turtle stuff, kind of, like I don't know if it's in this vein or what, but because of that, I just really wasn't paying attention to this movie. I would see a banner every now and then, and I saw like one picture of the turtles, and it's like it's. I was just kind of put off by the animation, and I just said that's probably gonna just get you know critically bashed, and fans will be indifferent, and it'll go away, and that's it. And then the reviews started coming out, and critics loved it, and fans loved it. It was getting a really overwhelming reaction, and so it was like, all right, let's, uh, let's see what happened. Um, uh, as far as the old animated show goes, I had a VHS as a kid that had like a few episodes on it, I think, and I have vague memories of that, and I probably watched it when it was on TV also, but I don't, I, I vividly remember like the animation and like, ha like how the cheese on the pizza was animated, and the shredder and stuff like that, um, but as far as, like, anything individual about it, I have no memory of whatsoever. Um, so all of my turtle passion really just comes from the original movie, uh, and growing up with that original trilogy, but, um, but that was, that was a lot of, that was a lot of turtle passion regardless. So, going to this, it is nice to see, finally, um, something else happening with this property that everybody can be equally passionate about. Because uh, there's a lot of creativity in this. It's interesting to see the duos that were involved in this. Because Rogan and Goldberg, like, you know, wrote it with, like, a few other writers. And um, Trent Reznor and Asgis Ross did the, did the music, uh, which is really surprising. Um, and it's, 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 their music is prominent, but it's also very, very, very soundtrack heavy. 
Um, but in a way that actually feels surprisingly appropriate. Like, it's some... There's quite a few songs in it to where it's like, is that song a bit too of the past for this? Like, does it feel like it's kind of reaching for this sort of wanting to feel youthful kind of way, like towards a youthful audience and feel like it's it understands them in a way? And while that, I think the reason the music works is because the turtles work in that regard, where if the turtles felt like they were trying too hard to be modern teenagers and failing miserably and coming off totally unnatural uh like we were talking about before like a corporate product or something trying to appeal to them then i don't think the soundtrack works i think the soundtrack can only work if the turtles work in this scenario and so that's where we find harmony uh to where a lot of this works and the animation where i was talking before about how when i felt like animation's gotten really soulless in like the last 15 years or so um, so movies like this and Spider-Verse really make a difference as far as feeling different and feeling innovative and bringing some sort of, like, if you can feel the passion of the people that made it, that's going to come through a lot. Um, and it's going to kind of transfer itself to the audience, I feel like, especially like, like you can see, you know, a live action movie where people seem passionate and it still won't come through, but with how precise animation has to be and how animation's telling the whole story, essentially, um, that's the kind of thing where if there's passion in that, that's that has no choice but to come through the screen and the audience feels it in some way. Um, and it makes it all, all the more this positive experience and also just brings you into the world much easier, especially if it's something that you're not used to seeing. Like what I talked about when I saw Into the Spider-Verse in 2018... I had a really hard time getting into it because the animation caught me so off guard because it was so different and new and I wasn't sure what they were doing exactly. Um, but when it comes to that idea of blending styles and doing this where it's like you can see where like the lines are colored in and stuff like that and it kind of looks like comic book pages or something. And that's something also where we talked before in, in the Mario movie about how these movies that are super energetic, how if they're too energetic, you'll run out of gas before we get to the end. And it's like the movie will keep going with its energy, but you as an audience member might be worn out <laughs> um, before it reaches the finish line. Um, but here the movie does feel constantly alive, and I feel like the, cha the changes in animation I feel like are a bit more subtle in this than they are in something like the Spider-Verse movies, uh, which is really impressive. And also glimpses of live action, like when they're... They go to, like, this outdoor screening of uh, Ferris Bueller. And not only is that, like, a cool effect where it's, you know, actually Ferris Bueller playing amongst the animated world, um, but how much that, like, sets up the character, <laughs> the characters and the story of how they want to they wanna be liked like Ferris Bueller is and they want to be popular. They want to go to high school and, like, actually live out that life. And setting that up where they actually, they actually do feel like kids who are kind of missing out on something where like i said it would have been really easy for them to feel like corporate teenagers um but it is and, and like their energy and how like hyper they are but that's something else they could feel like like hyperactivity in general can feel like it's desperate uh when it comes from a movie but when it's actually coming from the fact that that's just the way the characters behave and the movie's just trying to match their energy is where it kind of feel like it's it feels like it starts to blend together and how there's there's a reason this movie feels hyper. It's not just trying to keep the attention of the small children in the audience. Like it's it's super hyper and hyperactive because it has to be. It has no choice to be when the main characters are the turtles. So uh, the way they're able to approach that and make it actually work because I do obviously I've I've said that I love the original movie, but the thing about the previous live action movies was that you I mean, obviously you can tell that the turtles are played by adults so it makes them in the live action movies basically feel like immature adults rather than teenagers so to actually have them voiced by like people that sound like children <laughs> um and it's because the um the 2014 and 2016 movies also um which i i thought were you know People were a little... I, I like them more than a lot of people did, even though they're certainly not perfect, and they're certainly not the best representation of the the property itself. 
Um, but I, I feel like those still had things in there, but it still felt like the turtles were just sort of immature adults. Um, so like I said here, to actually see the teenager vibe, finally, it, it makes it makes the whole title make sense. Like everything is working together and it, everything feels like it fits into place now. Um, and while the movie does have energy and good characterization and the great animation, it does feel like it definitely goes up a notch when the full gallery of villains are introduced, where they're building up Superfly for a while, but then we kind of meet everybody at once here in the middle when this big meeting happens. And this is when, like, you know, the whole cast of the movie, like, you know, Paul Rudd and Post Malone and Rogan and Hannibal Burris and John Cena, uh, Rose Byrne, there's a, there's a really fantastic cast right in the middle of this, and it all kind of gets to come to life here at once, and you can definitely... And that's something also that would feel almost desperate. Um, where it's like... Like, with Rogan in particular, I was like, wow, they really only hired him for, like, three or four lines, and that was like... That was before I knew, oh, he, like, wrote it and produced it. That makes that makes much more sense. Um, but yeah, they all have these moments where all they get to all bring their individual energy into it, and you would think that that would be too much. It would be, like, way overkill, it gets way too chaotic... But weirdly enough, I don't know how they pulled this off, but you have the energy and the hyperness of the Turtles themselves, and then you bring in this whole other group of characters that are also really energetic and kind of hyper, yet somehow instead of making everything feel like uncontrollable chaos, it's... They're, like, the Turtles are surprised to see them. Like, the Turtles are actually, like almost, for lack of a better way of putting it, kind of go back into their shells a little bit metaphorically um, when they see this new group of mutants. And it's like they're psyched that they can relate to somebody and it happened to somebody else, but at the same time it's like they know this is a totally different breed of what happened. Um, and that dynamic brings a balance to all of the energy that's bouncing around, where it never, it doesn't feel like, oh, we've got enough of this and then we get another heap of it. Like, at this moment... It's like the turtles kind of back down for a little bit, and then the villain energy matches their energy, and then we reach this sort of, you know, great middle ground between there, and then with all of these characters bouncing off each other, it really it really reaches a, a sweet spot when the villains come into it, which is great because that could have been when it easily went off a cliff, and it got better. It got a lot better, actually, when the villains were introduced. And a, I think a lot of credit has to be given to Ice Cube, <laughs> um, who is fantastic as Superfly. He's also perfectly cast, because obviously Ice Cube can be very funny, but Superfly is also very threatening in a lot of cases. Even and it, Not only is it just sometimes he's one and sometimes he's the other, and the great thing is you never know which Superfly you're getting from moment to moment. Is it going to be... The Superfly that says something funny, or the Superfly that will kill you. Um, and the thing about that is that after a while, he just becomes both. Like, it's like when it, when it reaches the point where he's, like, basically at his peak villain status, he's funny and threatening at the same time pretty much all the time. And, and once again, he finds a perfect balance to do that. That's what... I, I feel like I'm throwing the word balance around here a lot, but that's something that really helped this movie a lot, was how they were able to find that. Uh, and like I said, with all that's going on here, I feel like it's kind of a miracle that they found it, but but they did. Um, and I think that especially works when you look at uh, talking more about balance, um, the different perspectives we got, because we do get the whole backstory again with um, Splint Splinter being played by Jackie Chan, which works... That sounds like, okay, that makes sense, but when you actually see it, like it, it really works. <laughs> Um, and the way they incorporate that also, where it's like, there's moments where Splinter will be fighting, and it's like, he, he does like the Jackie Chan thing, where he uses like, his surroundings, um, which is a really great touch, but he's also got that, um, there's something very warm about him, which you have to have with Splinter also, and the, the way they play him up as like a, like a dad dad, and not just like a master or a leader, um, where he's like, and that, that's something that also feels like it could have been risky, and maybe wasn't the best direction, but... It were, he is able to do both and kind of have that vibe of, you know, Master, and he's the one that raised them and trained them, and, and maybe he possibly has a dark background, and then the him just sort of being a dad. Um, and when we see his background where, when he first went to the surface and he tried to interact with humans, and 
it just everybody saw him as a monster. And there's this touching moment where he describes that coming across the turtles was the first, it was, they were the first faces that didn't want to kill him or just didn't hate him on sight. And then that's when he took them in, um, and raised them on Kung Fu movies, supposedly. But, um, taking that into account where that's what he did was he basically interacted with humans, got really scared of them and basically hid in the sewers and the same thing happened to Superfly, but yet he went a totally different direction, and now he's saying, you know, kill all the humans. And to kind of see this, sort of how the same thing happened to Splinter and Superfly, and then they took it in two totally different directions, and that's how we end up with a protagonist and an antagonist. It's really, it's really clean. It's really smooth how it's done, uh, and I really love that. I also love the inclusion of April being a bit younger, where instead of her being like a full-on reporter now, she's an aspiring reporter that's like still just writing for her school paper, um, and she's still and she's like this bullied kid um, for this unmentionable reason, um, but that plays a part a few times. Um, but I I like this idea of seeing uh, April as the determined, you know, aspiring reporter before we actually see her in that position. Um, because this is, this is something that does set up, uh, a lot of, how it can definitely keep going, and especially with that mid, that mid credit scene could be like a, oh, uh, yeah, of course this is gonna happen, of course they they have to have this scene and they have to do this thing, but after what we've gotten in this and the fact that they held off on what they were hiding, which anybody could guess what it is, um, I'm genuinely excited to see what they do. Apparently they've already been greenlit, so it's something that we are getting. Um, and I will be really interested to see how that goes. It actually could be not just an animated movie, but an animated sequel that I'm actually genuinely excited for, to see how well they handle it. Um, and it's also, also in general how they handled the darkness of it. Um, where I actually, I had to go back and double check that this was only PG, and they didn't bump it up to PG-13, because it is surprisingly dark and kind of violent for what it is. Um, and some of the dialogue I was surprised that they kind of got away with, too, where it does feel like... We're, we've been in an area for a while now where PG has basically just been G. Um, so to see this, like, really walk that line was really interesting and kind of felt refreshing in a bit, and a, a bit old-fashioned, in a sense, also, that they pushed PG that hard. So... Yeah, and like I said, all the stuff where they're building up to other movies, the the movie itself and what they accomplish here is satisfying enough to where it doesn't feel like it's just sort of empty sequel bait or franchise bait or whatever. The one thing I was kind of thrown off by was this this Maya Rudolph character. I think it was Maya Rudolph's character, the one that was, that like, seems to be building this sort of behind closed doors evil thing. Um, and she, like, the head of this whole operation... Um, she kind of seemed a bit underdeveloped, but I guess the point is that she's kind of this mystery figure, and then it's, um, obviously the lead-in in the mid-credits is like, nah, it's, yeah, okay, so she is going to be a bigger deal, and whatever she's planning is supposed to be part of a bigger picture, and that's, that's fine, because like I said, it doesn't feel like the movie's just focused on that stuff, it's its own sort of open and shut thing, and now it's ready to go on to this next thing, so, um, yeah, so that's... That's very surprising. Like even even with the uh, critical acclaim, uh, I'm I'm still kind of surprised. Uh, how, I think not just how well done it was, but how much that I actually took to it. Because like I said, I've I've been struggling with animation for a while, and even though it's critically acclaimed stuff, I have trouble finding some sort of connection to. But this obviously really works. So um, we're gonna kind of leave animation behind a little bit, but not completely. Um, we'll talk about the live-action Little Mermaid that Rob Marshall did in this very long string of these Disney live-action remakes coming. Like, I was, I was, I defended quite a few of these at the, when we were at the start of this. Um, but after a while we reached a certain point where it has become very soulless and corporate. I, I know people have been saying that since the beginning, and I know it's true to an extent, even with the ones that have been good. Like, I liked, uh, I really loved Favreau's Jungle Book, and when David Lowry did Pete's Dragon, I actually defended, um, the Beauty and the Beast one, and I defended the Dumbo one, and I saw Guy Ritchie's Aladdin again recently, and liked it a little better than I did when I saw it when it was in theaters. 
Um, but by the time we got to, like, Favre's Lion King and Mulan and stuff like that, that's where it's like, yeah, these are, these are just, yeah. I'm like, I'm, I, I know people have been saying this since the beginning, but I'm finally on the page of, yeah, they're, they're just turning these out now. This is just a machine working. Um, but the thing about it is I didn't really hate this one either for the first half. Like, I was, I was trying to, you know, see what they were doing. There's some very, there's some very rough CGI and some very rough green screen at the start of this one. Um, the, the flowing hair underwater is something they never got worked out in this movie. Like, I was hoping it would get better as it went, kind of like the rest of the CGI does. And it's, I don't know if the CGI got better or if I just got used to it after a while. Um, but I didn't hate it, you know, right away. Um, and like I said, it, it, the floating hair is, is where it just kind of, they never figured it out. But, um, as, as it goes on, it does have this nice sort of opening where we get these smooth character introductions where we start with, uh, Eric on the boat, and then that pretty seamlessly takes us to King Triton and Sebastian. That seamlessly takes us to Ariel and Flounder. That seam seamlessly takes us to Ursula. And it's like, it's a really, you know, smooth beginning here. It gives us nice introductions, sets the groundwork, and it's, and it's fine. And it's like, I, I didn't feel that cynical towards it. Um, the, th the thing that did, um, I, I, that I wasn't quite into was, first of all, seeing the length before going into it, and it's like, oh, well, the, the original movie was like, what, an hour 20, something very, very short, uh, and to the point, like many of them were, and the thing about this also, though, is that I don't really have a connection, much of a connection to the animated one, um, like, I like it, and I've seen it a few times over the years, but it's never one that I saw over and over and over again, like, you know, The Lion King and Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and stuff like that. Um, and some of the earlier ones. So, I didn't really have a reference point as to, does this do this as well as this, or does this fail because it was done so much better in this way in the animated one? I didn't really have much of a reference point as far as that went. I couldn't remember... There were some things in here where I couldn't remember if they were things in the animated movie or not. But there's obviously going to be difference be differences because this one's like an hour longer. And so it's like, what are they putting in here to eat up time? I'm going to assume not all of the songs in this one come from the animated one. I'm assuming they probably threw in a couple of new songs to try to get an Oscar nomination or something. Um, which are just, which are just going to be completely you know, emotionless and just time-wasting. Um, but speaking of wasting time, there was also a, a moment at the beginning here where Ariel and Flounder provoke a shark. And so there's a whole action sequence that plays out for a little bit of time where they're fending off this shark. They're trying to get away from it. And my immediate first thought was, okay, I'm pretty sure this isn't something that comes from anything else. This is just for this movie, which means... Not only are they really dragging out the runtime for some reason, but they're trying to make sure they have the attention of the the very small attention spans in the audience of the younger crowd um, who brought their money-paying parents to this. We have to keep those kids entertained, so let's just throw this shark thing in. But then I thought, maybe I'm being too cynical. Maybe this is set up. There's probably going to be something later that involves something like this, like a shark attack or something, or they're going to do something here to evade the shark, and it's going to play a part in what happens later. Um, and as far as I remember, no, this shark thing is a totally standalone moment at the beginning here that's just eating time. And that's, and that's all it's doing. Uh, and like I said, to keep, because we're going through all the character intros, we got to stop in the middle of this to make sure we have the kids' attention, and then we can do this. But... Yeah, so there's that. Um, but I will say that I do... I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about Melissa McCarthy's Ursula. And I think this is probably... It seems like she's not taking it that seriously, which is good. But I also feel like there maybe could have been more of a middle ground where it could have felt like she was... There was more passion about her going... Like, she could have gone full, completely hand, but I feel like she goes about maybe three-fourths hand. Like, she's almost there. She almost finds the sweet spot, the campy sweet spot, but it just kind of falls short of that, and I'm sure she should have been, she would have been capable of it. But, like I said, I, I like what she's doing here, but I feel like it was very close to going into this kind of campy greatness that it didn't quite reach. Um, but it's, as far as the rest of the movie goes, it, it works fine, I guess, with what McCarthy's doing. Um, but her, her and Javier Bardem, 
are both in this. Um, we've got to have our, you know, prestige actors with Melissa McCarthy has like a couple of Oscar nominations now and Bardem is an Oscar winner. And we're going to have to give them a lot of pun-filled dialogue. And what was interesting about that is that with Bardem, Bardem used his pun-filled dialogue and played it pretty serious. Um, like there's stuff, there's lines like, as long as you live in my ocean, you'll obey my rules, as opposed to live in my house, etc. Uh, and he plays that like it's like the most serious line of his career or something, and that's, I get where that's coming. Like if if you're the idea is to maybe just not go down the pun route, but if you have to go down the pun route, yes, the best way to do it is the way Bardem did it, where it's like you almost don't register it as a pun because he says it so incredibly seriously. Like this is, this is just the way they speak in this world, um, and um, it starts to show a little bit when he tells Sebastian. Uh, you give them an inch and they'll swim all over you. And that's... Yeah. Um, uh, now, McCarthy embraces her puns a little more. Um, where it's, uh, her, her father will hit the surface when he finds out. Um, it's, I didn't realize just how many of those are in here. Um, up, Ariel is a prawn in my little game. Uh, squidling rivalry. It, yeah, and I think it, I think that's another problem too is having two different actors doing two different things with the puns, where one's doing it super serious and one's embracing it in this campy way. That's the puns are probably just bad news. Uh, like they, <laughs> there's times where you know puns can sneak in and actually be funny in this, like I said, in this very sneaky way. Um, but here it's just, it gets more and more blatant as it goes, and it's like for God's sake, let's move on from the puns now. Um, but, but anyway, as it goes on, uh, I guess we can talk about Hallie Bailey, who I wasn't sure what I was going to think of her, because I don't even know that I'm much familiar with her outside of this. Um, uh, I, I actually thought she was fine here. I think she has a great voice, and her air, her aerial is quite likable. She's, she's obviously going to be likable no matter what, because of, uh, she does have a scene, uh, I know it's kind of cheap, but the scene where she helps the dog swim to safety. It's like, okay, that's, we can never hate this Ariel now. She saved the dog. Um, it's like, it's like the whole save the cat rule, but, um, just a dog in place and it's during a ship, a shipwreck. So there's that. And I know this was one of those cases where people were going in knives out because like we kind of like, like Barbie obviously brought out also for some reason, these movies that were made for small children and you know especially a younger female audience um dudes in their 40s are apparently really passionate about this <laughs> i don't i i don't know where that comes from but uh like i said people probably went in knives out but i, I actually thought she was perfectly fine um so like i said a, a good voice and being likable enough is all she needed to do um it's when i guess it's when she gets to the surface and has to act without words um, is where you could tell where the challenge was, but that's just kind of where the movie stops also, where I was talking about that I was okay with this movie for a long time. Um, it, everything just grinds to a halt once she's on land. And I, I don't remember if the animated one, I felt the same way about it in that way or not. Um, but in this one in particular, it's really clear that once they're on the surface and they're out of the ocean... Um, the movie's just a slog, like, the, the pacing slows down significantly, I give less and less of a shit about the characters as it goes on, the songs are getting more and more disposable and unmemorable, there's, er the guy that plays Eric, um, it's, he's not bad, but it's like, he gets a, a song, and he, you can tell when he's singing, he's like, super passionate, but I just... I just don't, I just did not care about that song. And that's basically, I felt like that set the, the tone for how I was going to feel for pretty much the rest of the movie. Um, and it's, there's some stuff that it touches on where the humans versus, you know, everyone that lives under the sea, there is something there as far as like some emotional core where, um, you know, Triton hates humans because he thinks they're responsible for what happened to Ariel's mother. And he's and the idea that he says, you know, humans have no respect for the ocean. And it's like, that that may sound a little preachy, but it's also extremely true. So there's something in there that does work, but 
like I said, there's no, there's no real emotional punch here, because like I said, once we get to the surface, everything is just, it's just like, we can try to speed this up, but once again, this is the movie that added another hour to the story, so it's not going to be that easy. So in the meantime, we have, we, we have our psychers, we talked about um, Flounder, who is Jacob Tremblay now, um, who's, who, who's there, he does the Flounder thing, uh, same with David Diggs doing Sebastian, who's, who's a great casting choice, and I love that they used his um, musical strengths uh, in the songs. And like, the Under the Sea number is obviously going to be something where you're kind of holding out, like, did they fuck it up or not? Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, I would say it's joyous in an appropriate way. Like, it's, and it, like, it's, it works well visually also in a way that I wouldn't say they, like, messed it up or anything. The same thing for Poor Unfortunate Souls, pretty much. Um, where it's like, they did, the best thing is they didn't completely mess it up, I felt like. But like I said, I don't really have a big connection to the other movie, so maybe some people will think they did, but I didn't really, it didn't really register one way or the other, um, if it was any less spectacular, so there's that. Um, if there's one side character that doesn't really work, um, they did bring in Aquafina to completely embarrass herself. And Aquafina's one move, over and, like, I didn't like Aquafina for a while, but then with, like, the Farewell and Shang-Chi and stuff, um, I started to become a fan, so now I'm willing to say that, uh, the material she was given is why she's in having to embarrass herself in this. Like, I, I don't blame her, I blame the material, I guess, so... <laughs> Um, that's where I'll keep that, but, uh, yeah, and then we get into this whole other thing that I, I don't remember from the, uh, animated movie either, that's another thing that just feels like it's sucking up runtime, which is Ursula posing as, like, this rival woman for Eric's heart. It becomes a whole part of, uh, becomes a whole conflict, um, when we could be really cutting things down and just getting to the point. Um, and then the climax happens in the big CGI way. Um, like, it's basically what we saw in the animated movie, just much bigger and CGI heavy and much more expensive. Um, and then that's, that's about it. That's what it is. I will say that the epilogue, I felt like, was, um, like everything after the action as we're getting to the end and her and Eric are having their moments and everybody's living in harmony. Um... It's it's touching and executed well enough in a way that I feel like it's a nice ending. Um, but like the climax itself just kind of felt like this expected CGI mess. So and it's where you you just know they're gonna go big and a lot longer than they should, and you just have to kind of wait it out. It's one of those climaxes. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, the first half was kind of starting to grow on me, but then it yeah then it kind of lost me. So. Uh, that's how I feel about that. So, to go on to Elemental, this is a movie that's had a really interesting life. <laughs> uh, just over the last, like, couple of months or so, or whenever it was, or last few months now, because it started at Cannes, and people have been talking about where is Pixar as a company now. It's like, are they kind of selling out, and are they, they're not as creative as they used to be. They're mostly doing sequels, and even their their original stuff doesn't feel up to par with the stuff they used to do, because they used to be known for making, like, a near masterpiece, like, every single year, practically. Um, and then it just kind of stopped at some point, kind of somewhere after Toy Story 3, I want to say. Um, and then where it st things started to get weaker, and they started to get more... more like uh, uh, the other, you know, animation companies that feel a bit more... the heart and soul just isn't in it the way it used to be. And so, when it came out, it, when it screened at Cannes and it got a not great reaction, I feel like a lot of us weren't that surprised, even with it being Pixar. So, it was like, and it was a case where it's like, oh, Pixar's really in a rut now. Um, but, as it went on, it got this, it seemed to help its reputation, I guess, that it got a not so great reaction. Because it was out forever. It might still be out now. And it, like, really quietly made a lot of money. When it kind of looked like it might fail by, I guess, reaction and word of mouth and stuff like that. And as time has gone on, now people seem to really be coming around on, it's actually not that bad. And it's, like, kind of being underrated is helping its reputation a lot more and kind of getting it a better... Sort of, it's starting to look better in the eyes of people. So it's like, now that it's kind of worked itself out financially and it's kind of starting to get this respect where people had the bar set really low after the reactions. So 
yeah, it's like all the bad things that happened to this movie seem to actually be helping it now. In a, and in a very natural way, too. Sometimes this happens in pretty manufactured ways, and you can tell it's the marketing kind of trying to work its way in. Um, this seems pretty legit that it's finding an audience that feels like it's underrated, and so is actually helping it a little bit. Um, though I will say it's... And I, I think that was working for me for a while also was... I did have the bar set so low that it was like... How it's fine. Like, I don't really have much against this movie. Um, where it's kind of... Basically, I feel about this pretty similarly to how I felt about Mario. To where it's like, it's it's certainly not a movie that I'm crazy about. And it feels pretty paper-thin once it lays out what it is. Um, but, like, the animation and the way it sets up the world and stuff like that. And just kind of a general likability is going to take it a long way. It's It's pretty eerie how similarly I feel between this and the Mario movie. How it's... That it's kind of that same vibe because this is one where obviously they they are trying to do the Pixar thing of saying something super profound amongst this world of you know things that aren't sentient becoming sentient and living in their own world and living in other rules of this world and so it's the idea of uh, earth wind and fire and all that um, living together and and water all living together in this world, but they're all, they all basically are different races, slash classes, slash whatever. It's all very, like, you can see where there was a, a more, like, specific idea here, but it did feel like there's still kind of, things were still handled in, like, a general way, where this, like, like, fire represents, like, you know, various different kinds of people, rather than something more specific. Um, and that's gonna be something to where it may be, doesn't feel as profound as it could or as profound as it's trying to be because it almost feels like they could they could have put even more detail into this and been more specific but it does feel like it's just sort of a summary of what its ideas are for the most part especially when you look at um the way earth and air like where air is, is like the clouds they're like these cloud people <laughs> um they're very underdeveloped. It's basically, when it becomes the fact that our two main characters are fire and water, um, which give us very obvious, you know, complications, um, air and earth just kind of get underutilized. Uh, and it kind of felt like, we. I feel like we could have had a major character from each one kind of be the center of this movie. But where the movie runs into problems is the fact that not only does it just focus on the fire and water characters, uh, Ember and Wade, their names are, it basically becomes a sort of, like an allegory for an interracial relationship and the problems that come with that and the prejudices that come with that. And that's really narrowing down what you can do with this concept because the the world that they built here, the city, I love what the city looks like and the way the city functions. Um, and like all the details you see going around it. Um, but it's like, and it's, it's so, it's so relaxing to look at this city. It's so well animated and just looks like this sort of utopia. Um, and then it's, and it's got all these, you know, colorful characters, but, uh, and very well animated characters. Like the way, uh, Ember and Wade have like, like how she's this constantly moving flame and he's like this constantly moving sort of water. Um, it's all really well done. And then... It's literally a star-crossed lover story that we've seen a billion times before. And and it's a, a a daughter that's trying to come out of, like, you know, the like this responsibility of feeling the need to follow in her father's footsteps and take over his shop and how... But she doesn't want to take over the family business. She wants to do her own thing. And treating this like it's a new concept. And it's like, like everything, everything on the surface of this movie is like new and fantastical and amazing looking and then the story itself is just something we've seen a billion times ever with no creativity whatsoever um and that's that's kind of a bummer because they really set something nice up um with the creativity as far as the the setting itself um but it's yeah <laughs> but as far as and also um some of the details like what they're capable of like how they can you know, blend together what the elements are. Like, um, there's some... I thought it was this really cool one-off thing, but it actually ends up being a whole storyline. Um, there's a moment where... There's a whole thing where Ember loses her temper a lot because she's fire. Of course, bad things happen and things explode and all that. Um, so she fi she fixes a glass case um, through this glass blowing thing. She, she can obviously pick up the glass and then use fire to recreate the glass and put it right back. 
And it's like, well, that was, that was kind of awesome. But then that it's like, it could have been a cool one-off moment, but then it ends up becoming a whole thing where it's like, this is basically, oh, she has this talent she can use instead of the follow shop. And it's used for that. It's used to progress the boring ass plot <laughs> rather than just being this cool one-off moment that it could have been. Um, and that's like, there's one-off moments also um, really work for a lot of the elements. Like we get a lot of, background scenes or like just you know scenes in passing of like you know air and earth having those moments um but then there is um the moment where wade is trying to hide that he's the inspector for the building for the shop and he's trying to hide his inspector tag but when he puts his hand over because he's made of water it just magnifies inspector um, stuff like that is really funny and works really well and uses the concept well for just those little individual moments it's when the movie's trying to constantly go big for reasons it doesn't have to. Um, is when I was starting to get kind of frustrated <laughs> with it. Um, because obviously, it's like, when it was just this whole thing of, oh, I'm, you know, trying to run my dad's shop and something goes horribly wrong and I burst the water pipes. And of course, water mixing with fire is not going to go well. Um, and Wade, because he's water, comes in through the pipes, realizes there's a problem here and reports this, and it's going to get the shop shut down. And now she has to fix this before the shop gets shut down. And it's like, when it was just that, like, that's not an original plot either, but the way it was using the concept itself and the characters and the way the characters interact in multiple ways, I was kind of good with that being the movie. And then you start to see pretty quickly that it's like, oh, no, this is too small. Like, oh, we, we can't do this. We have to, like I said, those small attention spans of the kids in the theater is what they're usually thinking about. So it's like, no, we have to be constantly going. We have to be getting big for seemingly no reason. So they have to kind of try to strike a deal with Wade's boss, who is one of the clouds. And this takes place during a giant sporting event in a giant stadium. And so there's a lot going on here. We have to watch this sport take place that really doesn't play into the story at all. Um, it, it lightens up this character a little bit because her team wins. Um, but they had to distract everything by having this big sporting event take place when this is just a small story about saving a shop that's happening, that's working just fine by itself. But no, we have to go big. We have to go as big as possible and as, you know, have everybody moving around as much as possible. And it's like, oh, so this is what it's going to be. So <laughs> we have these moments where it comes back down and it feels kind of small again, and it kind of plays on emotions and stuff like that. But then, of course, we have to set up, there's a bigger problem. Because, of course, there's a bigger problem. So it's like, oh, no, it's not just the pipes are a problem. Water's coming in from everywhere, but where is it coming from? We have to figure that out. So there's this whole big thing where water's coming in in big, massive waves, and it's going to potentially flood the area, and they have to figure out how to work that out. And so we realize right away, they fix that. And there's a moment here in the middle where they f they find a solution for, like, all the problems. Now, if this were one of the Disney movies from, like, the 60s and 70s that had, like, 70-minute run times, that's it. That's the game. Like, it felt, it did feel very abrupt that they found solutions for pretty much everything, like, right at this moment. But because this is the new age of Disney, the new age of animation and movies being longer... Um, we have to fix the solution, we have to find the solution just for it to become unfixed. So that we have to fix it again in a bigger way, because we have to go bigger, bigger, bigger when we don't have to. So, there's this moment where they fix the problem, and then we can see that the fix is not going to be permanent. Something is breaking that they thought they fixed. And then, we don't focus on that for like 20 minutes. 20 minutes of movie time. So, while the rest of the events of the movie are playing out, the very boring love story that we've seen every single beat of over and over again, they there's a conflict, they go their separate ways, they sulk and they act sad. And then we're just we're waiting while we're waiting for that to wrap up, we're waiting for this problem to increase so that they can fix it again so that we can have a big water climax. So, it's all, you can see everything coming from a mile away, and you're just waiting for things to happen that you know are going to happen. There is nothing around the corner that's going to catch you off guard, or be a little unexpected, or surprise you, or 
have a new development that's like, oh, how are they going to fix this? We know how everything is going to play out, how everything is going to work itself out, how everything is going to get fixed, how she's eventually going to tell her dad, oh, I don't want to run the shop anymore. I don't want to take over the shop. I want to do my own thing. And it's going to be as simple as that. We just have to wait for that moment. We have to wait for the water climax. We have to wait for that to fix itself. We have to wait for them to confess their love to each other. And they really drag that out. She gets really stubborn about just just letting it happen. It's one of those. So that's it gets it gets exhausting. So I'm actually I'm I'm liking the movie a little less the more I realize how much it kind of dropped the ball a little bit. Um, but like, and like I said, the bar was so low, it's still better than a lot of people were probably playing it up as or thinking it was going to be, but, um, it's, yeah, there was one thing that, uh, I, I loved, and it helped a lot getting through the climax. Um, the best thing about the water climax is that I was barely paying attention to it. Not, but you know what it's gonna be, so it doesn't matter, but, um... I was talking about how it's that moment that you see in like all romance movies where they break up, they go their separate ways, and they act sad and shit. Um, they found one thing that made me nearly fall out of my chair laughing, and I don't even know why I found it as funny as I did. But I was in hysterics. Like, I was in hysterics for so long I was still laughing through half the climax. <laughs> um, it's just this moment where Wade's family is like in the process of saying goodbye to him, and his dad gives him a painting. And I just found this so funny. What the painting is and what he says, what he describes the painting as was just so funny to me. I could not contain myself. <laughs> um, and so that, that helped me get through the climax a little bit because I was laughing about that one thing for so long. Um, but it's, it's kind of a drag when you know every single move it's going to make after it set itself up in such a creative way and made such a cool world. Um, it's just, there's also, there's also a lot of moments where we have flashbacks that kind of needlessly show us stuff that's being talked about, uh, that doesn't really add much of it. It's supposed to add more to the emotional factor, but honestly, and I know especially a Pixar movie should be a visual medium, but the flashbacks are so brief, um, I, I honestly feel like dialogue could have covered them a little bit, or at least maybe do the flashbacks in a bit more of a creative way, like, have, like, you know, like, have the imagery blend between the, na like, now and the past or something like that, but it's just a straight-on, just cut to a flashback, and it's just, we're watching things play out that they're describing. And that happens a few times, and most of them feel really unnecessary. It's also so brief that they're unnecessary, so... Yeah, but, um, I mean, I'm glad that it's getting a bit of a better reputation, because it doesn't deserve to be hated on, necessarily, but... Like, there's a lot of cases where it dropped the ball and got really generic after it laid the groundwork for something that should have been much more creative. Um, but the characters are likable, you know, the, vo the voice cast is really good, um, but it's, the likability takes it kind of far, but like I said, it's, once it gets wrapped up in its conflicts, it gets so dull and obvious at every turn, and that's that's unfortunate. So. Okay, so this is where I'm just going to really briefly talk about Across the Spider-Verse and kind of disappoint everybody, I guess, <laughs> that that took the time to come here to see uh, what could be discussed. Here's here's the thing about Across the Spider-Verse with me is, um, like I said, it took a little bit for Into the Spider-Verse to grow on me because I, I was kind of thrown off by the animation and the style and stuff like that, and I was a bit overwhelmed by it. I felt like it was kind of sensory overload in a not great way, but like I said, now that I've seen the movie a few times and I'm able to take in all the detail and the way they do all the different styles and stuff like that, um, and see that it's creativity out the asshole, um, and acknowledge that it's a brilliant piece of work as far as animation goes, both of them, um, I can absolutely respect that for sure. Um, and watching this also, when you like, especially in the theater, when you see the different styles, especially with like the way they do the watercolor stuff with Glenn, Gwen, and then um, there's um, when they do like the Renaissance stuff with the Vulture when he comes in, um, and also with Gwen when um, like when her emotions change, like the way the colors change and stuff like that, or the colors run and stuff like that. Um, all of it is really really well done, and then we get to stuff like you know the upside down scene and uh, scenes where, like, you know, worlds are colliding, and we're seeing, like, different, you know, dimensions and universes and stuff like that, 
Um, it's all really, really well done, and like I said, creativity, the likes of which we really have not seen in animation, at least for a very, very long time. Um, and you can just feel, when I was talking before about the passion, the passion that the animators have for their work, you can just feel coming through. And especially when you th hear about the conditions that animators work under. And to still see so much passion in their work coming through, there's something really special about these movies. Now, the reason I feel like I, what I'm saying is underwhelming is I can't really add to anything that people have already said because people have already gone absolutely insane <laughs> for this movie. I thought they went insane for Into the Spider-Verse, but we're on another level now of people loving uh, these movies, especially loving this one. Um, and the thing about it is that I'm, I can't find a passion. Like, when I watch, pe when I listen to people talk about this movie, and I, and I, like, when I see the scene, like, the upside-down scene, or when I see the watercolors running in the Gwen scenes, um, it's, I, un, I can see it, and I understand, like, this is, like, brilliantly done. Like, this is something that we have not seen. Um, but I, I, don't, there's no passion behind me saying, it. like, I feel, I can acknowledge it, and I'm sincere when I say that. But when I see people talk about this movie and they're like jumping out of their seats, their mind, their heads are exploding and their minds are like, you know, folding in on themselves. And I want so badly to feel that. And I genuinely have no idea why I don't. I just, I can only acknowledge that it's brilliantly done and there's so much work put into it. But all I can do is say that. Um, and I know that it's true. But I just, I wish I could completely lose my mind. And for some reason, it just doesn't, even seeing it in the theater, um, it was just, I don't, I don't know, I don't know why my passion is missing from these movies. But um, that's why I'm concerned about kind of talking about this is I want to do this thing. I want to react to it in this very passionate way, in this overwhelmed way. Um, but it's, all I can do is acknowledge it from afar. I feel, like, I feel so emotionally distant from it for some reason. Um, and it's not that it's lacking emotion. It's anything but that. Like, it's hitting people emotionally just as much as it is, like, the animation and people freaking out over that. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know what's missing in me, <laughs> um, that's making me not get passionate about it. But, uh, that's all I can do is say that I understand people reacting the way they are, and I can certainly acknowledge, you know, on a technical scale, what's going on here, but for me, there's just, like, I guess there's no emotional connection, and like I said, I can see those moments with, like, Gwen and her dad, and seeing the different things, and seeing, you know, like, you know, his, like, his, the, the flash of his dad when he's, like, going through the portal, stuff like that, there's all stuff here that's been adding up, it's been adding up since Into the Spider-Verse, um, and it's just... I don't know. I don't know what's missing in me to make me not fall in love with these movies the way everybody else is. I love, I love the idea of the spot as the villain and what he's capable of. That's new and interesting. Um, I love the idea of how, and especially for a movie that's so creative and innovative, I love how much disgust it, the word algorithm is said throughout the movie. Um, okay, that's, that's really um, satisfying. But um, that's... Like I said that's what I that's all I can really give it is I can acknowledge that I understand I understand people are extremely passionate about it I wish I was there all I can do is say e everything is in working order and great um, but I just can't jump out of my chair for some reason I don't know but I will say one thing uh, actually I'll say two things um, one thing was about that idea of uh, the sound having to be corrected I saw it in the theater after all of that went down. Now, here's the problem, is number one, I don't know if, um, my criticism was going to be, they might have overcorrected the audio, because there was a lot of stuff where, like, dialogue was really clear, and a lot of other things were clear, but then, like, s like sound effects felt, like, really, really soft. Um, and so my assumption was that they might have overcorrected the sound a little bit, to where, like, you know, the, the action sounds were, were much softer now, and were kind of out of balance. 
Um, but I also saw uh, Oppenheimer and The Equalizer 3 in that same auditorium, that very same room, and the audio might just be shit in that theater. So I don't know if that had anything to do with the audio correction or if it was just that theater, but um, that's just something I was going to throw out there. And also I will say, as far as passion goes, something this movie did give me an experience that I was really happy to have, especially in the theater, which was... I was under the... I remember when this movie was announced, and I remember them saying it was going to be two parts. So I kind of assumed everybody knew that already. Like, I, I, I didn't know if it was advertised like that or not, but I remember knowing right away, like, from the beginning, that this was going to be two parts, this one and then the next one. Um, so it would make sense if this one had, like, a cliffhanger ending. Well, apparently, from what I've been hearing, a lot of people did not know that going in. So... My really fun experience with this was I went to the theater and I saw it and it was in the middle of the afternoon, but it was really packed anyway. Um, and the thing about it was, despite how much people love this movie and how much passion there is behind it, this was a pretty quiet crowd. Like, it felt like a pretty dead crowd. And I was concerned because it was like, there'd be a laugh here and there, but for the most part, it was pretty silent for a theater that was pretty full and that went on for the whole movie, and it was like, oh, that's that, it must not be hitting with this audience or something. That's that's interesting, okay. Um, and then To Be Continued came up as it ended. And the total chaos that broke out <laughs> when this happened. Um, I don't think anybody in that theater knew this was a part one, part two kind of thing. But I'm going to guess that the audience was just so mesmerized they weren't really reacting because they sure as shit reacted when To Be Continued popped up. Um, and it was glorious. People were angry, people were confused, people were excited. Uh, that was that was really fun to witness. I hope a lot of people got that experience, and I'm sure they did. They probably experienced it themselves firsthand, uh, all those emotions. So, yeah, so I can totally appreciate Across the Spider-Verse, but it's, I don't know, my heart's not in it for some reason, and I hope that's... Uh, not too disappointing or whatever. So that's how I feel about that. Maybe if I see it again, um, something will change. Uh, but as of now, it's it's more of an acknowledgement of its greatness than me feeling it, sadly. So that's, I think, where I want to leave that. So tomorrow is going to be another Versus, and then after that, another retrospective thing, and then it might be another Versus, I don't remember. Um, but we'll continue on. We're on the other side of September now, and then we'll have October stuff, which should be super fun, I hope. Uh, so until all that stuff, I think that's it.